as Muslims, we're the only ones who can represent ourselves. No one else is going to do it for us, right? The non-Muslims are not here to do that for us. And so who are we waiting for? If it's not going to be us, it won't be anyone. <laughs> Welcome back to another episode of Muslimi Meets. I'm your host, Ashley Priestakhan, with my co-host, brother Yusuf over here and Idol. And today we are talking to Faisal Kuti. So happy to have him talk about all things Islamophobia as well as social justice. Super excited to hear from you today. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Good to have you, uh, brother Faisal, uh, with us. You know, Islamophobia. Uh, some will call it an innocuous term, some a foreign term, um, uh, but it's a term that has touched the life of us Muslims for the better part of the last decade, and uh, two decades actually. So I wanted to, you know, mashallah, uh, Brother Faisal, you've been involved in this space for, for, for quite some time, um, and I thought it'd be good to walk us through, um, you know, the concept uh, from, like, you know, when we look at 9-11, um, change everything in terms of how Muslims were viewed and Muslims reaction right and you were right at the forefront during that time you know and I thought uh, maybe you could talk a little bit about that um, um, of, of where Islamophobia in some ways where it started or what happened that got us to in some ways to today okay so I think Islamophobia started well before 9-11 what 9-11 did uh, from my perspective is it opened it up so that government and legislation could be used to actually enforce and uh, you know increase Islamophobia, but Islamophobia I think came long before. I mean the first instance that I've written about this uh, of Islamophobia is really when the Muslims were trying to escape and they ended up in Abyssinia when they're being chased for their religious beliefs, and then the king gave them safety, and the Christians gave safety to people running away from Islamophobia. That's the first instance. And Edward Said actually writes about Orientalism, okay? That is really Islamophobia, and that goes way before. It comes out of the Crusades. But in contemporary times, yes, Islamophobia really we see happening right after 9-11. But what really happened in 9 after 9-11 is really the government got involved in the process of legislating and making it okay and giving voice to it. And basically, you know, and at some levels, the anti-terror laws, the Patriot Act in the United States, but even in Canada, the Anti-Terror Act, basically it, it made it okay to persecute and prosecute Muslims officially from the state level and there's really no recourse, no safety. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Uh, I'm sure uh, Sister Ashin, um, Sister Edel would we'll probably add some stuff, but, you know, you're talking about legislation and, and you just mentioned, I mean, in our own country's context, I'm sure you, you, you worked in this when uh, the conservative government, w when they, you know, made some very nefarious comments about NCCM or the infamous barbaric cultural line, right? Um, so the legislation really was a game changer. But like going back to this legislation, what did it do uh, in, when, when the government involved? Like what was the role of government in your opinion or the importance of government legislating it? So, so even before the government legislating, so prior to 9-11, so I've been a lawyer since 1996. I was a law student I was uh, prior to law law school I was at York University as a student and at that time there was you know it, it was known at that time as the green menace anything coming from the Muslim world especially after the Islamic Revolution in Iran and what happened in Afghanistan you know initially the Western powers wanted the, the Mujahideen they were supporting and funding and everything and then when things changed they became the jihadis and they became the bad guys Okay, and then various agenda-driven groups actually started funding this green threat, the green threat, the green menace. And that's what gave rise to these other things coming up. So what happened was, I think in 1993 even, there were some groups actually, and I wrote about this back then, uh, and I warned the Muslim community saying, there's some individuals who are coming actually from the United States, primarily, uh, really from the Zionist segments they were coming into Canada and they're actually meeting with government officials and I actually wrote an article at the time very few people probably even paid attention to that issue at the time uh, and I remember the year I think it was 1993 they came here 
they met and they actually laid the foundations for the anti-terror laws. Basically how to revoke charity status from Muslim organizations. Today we're, we're, we're hearing it in the news. If you listen to the CRA revoking charity, this is not something new. In 1993, they came, they had a meeting with government officials, basically saying, look, these organizations need to be uh, watched. They're sending money, and primarily the focus in that time was Palestine. They didn't want money to be sent to these areas. And so the seeds were planted. Then they kept watering the plants. And then 9-11 happened, this incident happened. They said, hey, wow, we've got all this legislation already. That's why if you ever pay attention uh, to this, read this closely, the Anti-Terror Act was the fastest enacted legislation in the history of Canada. How is that possible? Laws take years, but in this case, in months, right? Because it was already, everything was laid down. They just kind of rolled it out. Oh, wait, this incident happened. Let's come out. And so, so we need to, as you know, many of our young people were not aware of this. And we need to educate. Knowledge is really uh, important. And we need to, you know, more and more people are going into law and political science. And it's really good and important. But we need to go dig deep and see, look, how do these, these things just don't happen one day, right? So we need to, and what am I getting to here? Why do we need to know this? Because we need to have institutions then, like NCCM, like other groups that are actually digging deep and addressing these issues at that level, not just at the surface. You know, we, 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 we tend to react. We can't be reactionary. We have to be proactive. And, and these groups are really important for that. That's right. And I feel like the same way that they're preparing and they're being so strategical, the only way that we can combat that as Muslims, we're the only ones who can represent ourselves. No one else is going to do it for us, right? The non-Muslims are not here to do that for us. And so who are we waiting for if it's not going to be us? It won't be anyone. So how do you think that we could prepare for this? How do we educate younger people? Because it's such a broad thing. And a lot of people feel like it's, it's you know, bigger than their head almost, you know, when it comes to that. And it's so much information to kind of take in. So where do we start? Because everybody maybe would be interested, but the how-to is important. I think the institution building, I'm very happy to see a lot of young people volunteering with uh, NCCM and other groups and, and, and the, the project that uh, Brother's working on. You know, these kind of initiatives are really important to really get young people in there and lay down that pro, the groundwork for that proactive work. And uh, that's the only way. We can't be, you know, and a lot of people are going to get mad at me for saying this. Uh, you, we, for so many years, we've been just uh, the bricks and mortar projects of building mosques, the bigger mosques, uh, the, you know, 80, 80,000 square feet, 100,000. Really, at the end of the day, these are just buildings and structures that maybe 5, 10 people might be praying in. And great for them to, but do you really need these massive institutions where we're spending billion, millions of dollars? Or should we direct that to these projects, these initiatives, right, that are really tackling these problems that we need to? The police, you know, if you really evaluate, I had, I had a client call me, okay? This is really, to me, it was shocking. Client calls me and says, you know, they're having a matrimonial dispute. Police is called. Police shows up. They're supposed to. And it's zero, uh, you know, zero tolerance, which is fine. I agree with that. But what, what the police then does is speaks to the wife and the, and the husband privately and then basically says to the wife, says, I'm, we're going to leave now, but what do you plan to do? You need to go and talk to some counselors. Very good. You need to do that. But then the police officer has the audacity to say, do not go to any mosque or any imam. Don't go to them because they're going to tell you to go stay with them. I'm like, wow, that is Islamophobia. Wow. Right? How do you tell somebody from the Muslim community that you don't go to the mosque to get counseling are, are very and, and very it's a discriminatory like you know to assume that every single imam and every single mosque is going to be pro-male and anti-woman that is the definition of Islamophobia are some imams maybe misogynist yes are some priests mis of course some secular people yes but to generalize and say don't go to the yeah, mosque yeah. And, and he tells and then when they called me now they were together, then they're like, hey, what do we do? So he said, we need to bring this, uh, make a complaint to the police, right? This is unbelievable. They generalize it. This officer is going to go everywhere and assume that every single Muslim organization is misogynist. Exactly. Or, you know, yeah. so that's, that's what we are up against. And we need to have work done at the grassroots Absolutely. level. Absolutely. And at the proactive level to challenge these things and expose them, right? We can't be sitting aside because if we don't, like you said, if we're not the one doing the work to defend and then expose will, and yeah. champion this, nobody else will. I mean, brother, uh, brother here has been working so hard yeah. for a cause. Yeah. And you know what? He, was, he probably thought he was alone and he probably felt alone most yeah. of the time. 
But at, from time to time, he did get people helping him, and he did pe people did take you know an active interest in this and pushing this. Yeah. And we're seeing some progress. Yes. And he'll do that. Another person will do that. Another person. Then yeah, hopefully together effect. we can it we is, can yeah, do it. Absolutely. Right? That's the only way. Yeah. And there's power in number too. You know, exactly. all these other communities they come together and they are a united front. And when you're a united front, anything is possible because we do. Ha nobody can deny the fact that a lot of young Muslim pe people are educated. Yes, we yes. are educated. A lot highly of us, educated. Uh, yes. Highly educated. A lot of us have been born here. Yes. Right? We're, we're no longer in survival mode. Yeah, exactly. So, and we don't have to have the distractions of just we're so boxed into only creating the masjids and only being cornered in. And, and you're right. We do need to branch off into these things. But I feel like we need to use the media. Like right now, we're all sitting together. We're having this conversation. Yes. Hopefully this is what's going to actually change that because people need to hear not just from commercials or like other places, but from people like you who can say, hey, listen, this is how you do it. This is why it's necessary. And, you know, we all need to kind of rally together to do that. Absolutely. It's, you know, and it's um, and what I'm hearing from Brother Faisal is like, it's always, you know, you haven't said it, but uh, directly the word, but it's like engage, 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 engage. And then what Sister Idol brought up earlier, it's like we can we have what is our narrative? Yes. We yes. have to tell our story, you know, and, and I think I wanted to shift to that and, and, and want to hear about Faisal Kuti's story in terms of um, your path, Faisal, like where it brought you here, like what happened, you know, uh, in that trajectory that to got you to where you needed to. Then look, before I, uh, before I, you know, you, you start talking, like I know 93, 94 is an interesting year. There's Samuel Hunting Thing's book too. Yes, I'm yes, sure you read that yes, book. Yes, so, yes, yes, yes. You know, uh, we want to like really know that story of the, the path, the bar you are today. Yeah, we'd love Perfect. to hear that, your personal connection. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I got into, I, I went to law school, I went to university thinking I want to go in and, and do some business degree and, and then start a, pra a business and, and make money and that's it. I just went to, university to make my parents happy that yeah, I'm yeah, going to university. <laughs> but when I got there, uh, I became involved in the MSA. Uh, I was a president of the, at that time it was called the Muslim Student Federation. And so we got involved in activism. And at that time, the president of Israel was invited to York University to be given a human rights award. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So, so at that time we said, wait, of all the people in the world that the university is picking, it's this individual, right? So we're like, this is wrong. So we started a campaign to bring, you know, human rights is important. And at the time, the York Federation of Students uh, joined with us and other groups joined and we had a huge protest and they couldn't have the event at York University. They had to do it elsewhere. So it was like, for me, it was like, wow, we actually made- We have power, yeah, we yeah, have we, a seat we, at we the table. We did something. It, you, you can actually make a difference, right? And then people kind of planted the seed in me, like, you know, people, I would see people in the community. I was active in the community. The, you need to go into law. And then they kind of just planted the seed, right? I never thought about it. I didn't think I was smart enough. I didn't think that's my field. I'm not a student. I wasn't a serious student. But then people telling me that and the fact that we did this change made me want to become a lawyer. And then I, I did become a lawyer, alhamdulillah. And then in law school, uh, I started the Muslim Law uh, the, I think it may have been the first Muslim Law Student Association in Canada. That's at the amazing. Time. So I started that. And then I left and then started the Canadian Muslim Civil Liberties Association. Because when people found out that I was a first Muslim lawyer, uh, anytime there'd be an issue, they would call me, right? So I kept call, getting all these calls, you know, CAS has taken away my child. Uh, CAS did this, this, this organization did this. So when I became more active in that, I said, we need to start a group. So I started a group called the Canadian Muslim Civil Liberties Association. Okay. And then a few years later, uh, Sister Shima Khan yes. and Riyad Saluji, uh, they approached me and they said, why don't we start a group called the uh, Care Can? Uh, Care Can. So we actually sat down in our office at the time and we uh, started the Articles of Incorporation. We filed the document and became Care. And Care, for uh, some of the people may not know, um, Care then evolved into NCCM, right? So we ran it for many, many years and a few of us, you know, we kind of left it and young people have taken it over now. Alhamdulillah, I was very impressed to see Stephen Brown and uh, wow, we've come it's very amazing, far yeah. from, I remember sitting in my office, you know, a few of us just signing the papers and filing that never thought, yeah. you what know, it would that become. wow, one day yeah, it would become a very do. big yeah. organization, yeah. right? So alhamdulillah, that, then it kept me interested in activism because uh, being the son of an imam and somebody who's active in the community, uh, every, most, every issue that was targeting the Muslim community, they would call, right? So between care, uh, between CM, uh, CMCLA, Canadian Muslim Civil Liberties, and my office, we started doing a lot of activism work, advocacy work, and then 9-11 happened. When 9-11 happened, 
again, people called on us, uh, you know, for help. So we were at, uh, you know, our, our law office uh, was pretty prominent in, uh, in being at the parliament, uh, you know, campaigning against the anti-terror. We, we tried to get some changes made in there. Said so this is discriminatory. Uh, you know, we were at the forefront of the anti, uh, the no-fly list. So we're very, very, very active. And Alhamdulillah, it's been very good. Initially, all that activism work, they, they, it doesn't really pay. Yeah. Right? Activism doesn't, yeah. doesn't pay you yeah. and doesn't pay your bills. Okay? But Alhamdulillah, Allah always looks after you because Absolutely. That's right. because we did that, I think our exposure also, we got more exposure. And then the business side also picks up because people would actually give us work because they would say, oh, these people are doing stuff in the community. Let's give them our corporate work. Let's give them our... So Alhamdulillah, everything just kind of uh, grew from there. MashaAllah, you've done some amazing work. Um, is there anything that you want to share that you're working on now? Any special projects or anything? So right now, I'm, I'm uh, really kind of giving deeper thought into how you, we can address Islamophobia, uh, you know, kind of really targeting. Uh, my focus is really to try to target judges, try to target uh, decision makers from more behind the scenes. Uh, you know, we need some people to be shouting from outside. Yeah, but we right? need you other need, people need, to... And, and, and also from inside. So one of the things I've been positive enough to do in my in my um, uh, profession as, you know, I practice law, but I also teach. So over the past uh, 12 years, I've taught uh, different law schools, and I've been able to make connections with a lot of law students who've become judges now, who've become uh, members of parliament, who've become uh, uh, Congress people. So I think from behind the scenes, you you're trying to influence them and uh, you're trying to get them to think about these issues outside from the traditional framework, right? So that's been my work now in the, in the last few years, more behind the scenes, but trying to continue the work while the people, the others are also doing work from both sides, right? So we have... That's amazing. I think, you know, what I'm going to remember most about this sitting is that you said other people poured the idea of you becoming a lawyer into you and they believed in you before you even had that vision. And now that you're now going to go and, you know, give the same type of hope to others. You know, this whole thing is, uh, it's, it's a village of people helping each other and passing it on and passing it forward, right? Exactly. And paying it forward is something that will benefit you hopefully in this world and the hereafter. So of we want to thank you, alhamdulillah, for, you know, being somebody who's a good representative and for the sake of reference, you know? We need more reference. Absolutely. Before you end it off, Sister Lil, you know, um, there was a Sheikh Suleiman Mullah, he had a famous quote. He said, aspire to inspire before you expire, yeah. you know? You're inspiring us, and uh, honestly, he was too humble about some of the other work he's doing. If folks, he's, a, he's a, also a columnist. He writes columns in the Star, and his Twitter handle is like uh, the Muslim lawyer. Yeah, I need to go check so that check, out. check it out. People should check it out. Uh, Brother Faisal does a lot of uh, critical work for our community, and may Allah bless his work. Jazakallah. Yes, thank you so much for joining us, and I hope that someone watching this will be inspired to help make a change as well. So Inshallah. we really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for watching. I hope that you have been inspired to take action, get involved in fighting Islamophobia. We are one ummah and we need to work together as brothers and sisters to help one another. So stay tuned for more content from Muslimi as well. We'll see you guys next time. Assalamu alaikum.